from Seattle City Club. Um, welcome to our chat today on COVID-19 and the impact on healthcare for marginalized communities. Um, this is an hour long uh, webinar. We've got um, about 45 minutes for conversation with me moderating and then 15 minutes to take your questions at the end. And if you want, please type in your, your questions in the chat. And so we will compile those and, uh, and kind of summarize those at the end. Um, you, just so you know, this is recorded. So we're gonna be able to use this link and uh, uh, tell people what's, what's happened later on. Um, I wanna thank Nuha el uh, uh, with uh, Public Health Seattle and King County. She's helping in the background and my colleagues at Seattle City Club for also helping uh, with this. Um, I also wanna thank Alaska Airlines, who is our Civic Boot Camp sponsor, supporting partner. So I really appreciate them stepping up in this challenging time. Um, so I wanted to start um, right away and jump in with introductions. So how about Nicole? Um, just tell us about who you are, what you do and your organization. Sure, so I'm Nicole Macri and I'm the Deputy Director at the Downtown Emergency Service Center, DESC, which is uh, one of the largest um, homeless response organizations in our state, um, working specifically with people who um, have long histories of homelessness and behavioral health um, disabilities and often complex medical conditions. And we serve about 3,500 individuals on any given day um, including about uh, 600 uh, folks in congregate settings, which has um, presented unique um, challenges to us during this public health crisis. Um, we also operate about 1,400 units of permanent supportive housing um, uh, for people who are formerly homeless and living with disabilities, and a whole array of behavioral health services, including crisis response um, services for the county, um, as well as street outreach services, outpatient services, um, and an, an array of kind of specialty care for people living with behavioral health disabilities. Um, outside of my work at DESC, I serve in the Washington State uh, Legislature. I'm the state representative for the 43rd Legislative District. Um, and uh, that role as well has been obviously very uh, relevant uh, to the work that we're doing here in the legislature this last session um, in our final days and hours um, we did a lot of work um, specifically around COVID response. And that work, uh, particularly with the governor's team, um, has continued nearly every day. Just a quick follow up. What is the, where's the th 43rd district? Is that, can you just? Mm -hmm. uh, the 43rd district is, I like to call it the heart of Seattle. So it uh, runs from about the Pike Place Market to just north of the University of Washington campus. Okay, thank you. So Ahmed. Welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ahmed Ali. I am a practicing pharmacist. Uh, I run an independent pharmacy in Seattle called Othello Station Pharmacy. I'm also a founding member of uh, an organization called Somali Health Board, which is a nonprofit organization that has ambitious goals of uh, reducing health disparities within immigrant refugee communities, uh, particularly in King County. And we formed this organization about five or six years ago. Uh, acting as a liaison between the, the, the health system and the Somali community. As you can imagine, when new immigrant refugees uh, move to the United States, their experiences with the health system is significantly different than it is currently here in the United States. So as healthcare professionals that include doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, public health professionals, uh, and others, we decided that we want to sh ensure that with our experience and our work in the health field, that the Somali community uses, um, ensures that the Somali community takes advantage of the appropriate services. With that, we've come up with different programs that have been uh, uh, informed by the community uh, that ranges anywhere from uh, healthy eating, nutrition classes, uh, chronic disease education programs, uh, uh, programs that are linked with uh, current clinics such as Health Point uh, and uh, others as well they include the Centering Pregnancy for Pregnant Mothers. We have worked uh, primarily to address stigma on mental health and a lot of those programs are programs that are actually informed by the community. Uh, currently we have a full time of 11 employees 
uh, started off as a, as a volunteer organization. And the objectives have been uh, the last three years ensure that the community uh, understands what they are, uh, the services are available for them and also ensure that some of the policies and systems that uh, inevitably affect immigrant refugee communities that we are sitting at the table and discussing those with our elected officials. And I want to thank you guys for inviting me this, this afternoon. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter. So hi, I'm, I'm Peter Shallot. I am a uh, primary care physician with uh, an independent clinic in Seattle. Uh, our clinic focuses on the LGBTQ communities. Um, we have uh, two physician assistants and a nurse practitioner in addition to myself, and we serve probably four to 5,000 folks uh, in these communities. Um, these, uh, most of our patients are sexual minorities or gender minorities in terms of uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, gender variant uh, folks, uh, many of whom are um, uh, feel stigmatized or underserved by the mainstream medical community and come to us uh, because they feel that uh, they would get uh, care that's respectful and also appropriate for their particular circumstance. The, the communities vary a lot. The, what they have in common is is uh, sort of outside the mainstream of um, gender and sexuality. But uh, beyond that, the needs obviously of uh, transgender folks are very different health-wise from let's say gay men. Uh, so uh, the focus for transgender folks is hormone therapy for gay men. It may be HIV prevention or HIV treatment, et cetera. So that's what we do. And Nicole, I think you're our state representative, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, Mario, I think you've joined us. Are you, are you around? Can you give us a brief introduction? Yes, um, thank you so much for um, having me this afternoon. Um, I'm Maria Torres Medapur. I'm with uh, Public Health Seattle, King County. Um, I don't believe that our area is represented by Nicole, but thank you for all the hard work that you do as well uh, for uh, the residents of our county. Um, Currently, with our COVID-19 response, I'm serving as the equity officer for our health and medical man. Um, so we're, we're basically the lead agency uh, when it comes to the health response to COVID-19 in our county. Um, when I'm not working in this capacity, um, I am the section manager for the chronic disease and injury prevention section at our public health department. Um, where much of our work is, is focused on policy and systems changes, um, which, you know, are linked tightly to the social determinants of health that affect the health and well-being of um, many of our residents that um, basically are part of marginalized communities. And so um, over 20 years experience working with community members, um, both in California and here in Washington State, um, especially with uh, community health workers or promotoras. Thank you, Mariel. I, I wanted to start with you actually on uh, just giving us a really brief summary of what is, what is COVID-19, just so we all know, and what is this, the status here in, in our region right now? Okay. Um, so I, I want to be able to uh, provide a disclaimer. I am not a doctor or a nurse by profession. I, um, I'm trained as a uh, public health professional as a, uh, with a master's in public health. Um, so um, I just want to kind of start off with that. But uh, COVID-19 is within the family of coronaviruses, uh, which is a large family of viruses that um, can cause illness in both animals or humans, um, typically respiratory infections. So in the news a few years back, you might have heard about MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or SARS severe ac acute respiratory syndrome. And those were, they're not the same as COVID-19, but they're within the, the family of coronaviruses. So they, they share kind of the genetic material. And so what we find ourselves today, at least as of this morning, um, is that our county, we have uh, 1,711 cases um, of confirmed positive COVID-19 with 126 deaths. Um, so I think um, what we're seeing right now is that, uh, you know, we do have testing that's been ramped up. So, you know, we are seeing a, a number of tests, um, but I think um, the level of escalation when we compared to even a month ago 
Uh, we're seeing it um, happening in, in real time out in New York, New Orleans, and, and other areas um, and as opposed to us. That doesn't mean that we're in the clear. Um, that's why we're practicing physical distancing um, because of just the severity of, of this particular disease for the most vulnerable um, folks that are at risk. So when we talk about folks that are at risk, it's people that are um, 60 years or older, um, we're looking at individuals with uh, chronic conditions, underlying chronic conditions, let's say like, for example, COPD, asthma, high blood pressure. Um, and, you know, we're also, you know, thinking of, you know, our homeless population where um, they're exposed to many different elements, correct? And, and they're not, uh, the housing um, um, situation is, um, is, is, is precarious. And so um, not that they are necessarily more susceptible acceptable, but it's kind of a, a weighted addition um, to age and or underlying chronic conditions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think before diving into the COVID-19 impact on healthcare, I wanted to talk a little, little bit about health equity and what we mean by health equity in terms of your work. So maybe actually, why don't we start with Nicole? What is, what do you, what is health equity and how, why is it important in what you do? Oh, there, I got my slides. There you are. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, for me and my work, both as a policymaker, but uh, working with uh, people who have really uh, struggled uh, to access healthcare because of tremendous barriers, health equity really is the ability for people to um, be able to, to get not only their health care needs met, um, but really to um, have access to to good health. Um, and when I think about the uh, folks we serve at DESC who have lived homeless often for many years, um, who um, have compounding behavioral health and um, medical condition complexities, um, the challenges that we see, quite frankly, is that we have a whole um, healthcare delivery system um, that was built without without the needs of this population in mind at all. Um, and so there are huge barriers um, to accessing care. And those um, barriers certainly are, um, we see them highlighted during the current public health crisis. So um, it is uh, a challenge um, for many people who have um, significant trauma around um, uh, interaction with medical professionals. Um, because they um, have only had the ability to seek care when they are in medical crisis or behavioral health crisis. Um, we have folks um, who have been relegated to um, care um, opportunities, um, often from early points in life, um, where it is just intimidating, where the care um, is limited um, for them. And um, as I said, is only happening um, when they are in some kind of acute um, healthcare condition. Um, and so that presents um, challenges always in making sure that people can get uh, preventative care, that they can get ongoing routine access to care, um, care that is um, culturally relevant to their experiences. And um, we really see that those barriers playing out um, in acute uh, real-time ways right, right now as we are trying to get um, access to basic um, things like access to testing for high-risk um, individuals. Um, and then I would say um, for people who are living unhoused, either completely unsheltered or in congregate settings, um, the risk of <clears throat> exposure to all sorts of things all the time um, that are not good for them uh, is is just a constant way of, of living. We know that um, um, people with behavioral health disabilities on average live 20 years less than people in the general population. So having a behavioral health disability is an indicator um, for early mortality greater than any other indicator. Um, and there are lots of other indicators for early mortality, um, including um, economic, um, socioeconomic status, um, race, um, gender, et cetera. But um, so we have not only people who are living in um, extreme um, 
poverty and without access to to the most basic survival um, getting their most basic survival needs met but also living with um, a set of health conditions that further um, create inequities for them and, and disparities in their ability to have good health. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, Ahmed, what, what's, your, what's your take on health equity and the importance in your work? Uh, thank you. I, I want to be back on what uh, Mercy had mentioned early on, and I think that by definition, the health, uh, uh, health equity has already been defined. But in regards to the work that we're doing right now, uh, it's, it becomes much more clear at this point, uh, the current coronavirus, uh, coronavirus epidemic has actually indicated in so many ways that uh, the way the system is already set up uh, has, is starting to indicate and show the gaps that exist with health inequities within communities of color, refugees, and immigrants. Uh, if I may uh, right now talk about, for instance, uh, something as simple as access to, to health care. There are a lot of folks who might not have health insurance coverage, who are scared to go to the doctors because of bills they might be able to receive. They might, seem, they might show symptoms of what is considered uh, at this point possible, uh, COVID-19. Some of the discussions that we had with our community members, uh, you know, flu-like symptoms that you have to be screened in order to ensure that you get tested for. So when we're talking about health inequities, we're talking a lot of barriers, uh, whether it's cultural, whether it's linguistic, oftentimes even religious, um, the social aspect of where those folks live, there's some of the access that might not have with, with, it, with diminished transportation at this point, uh, housing in itself, food insecurity. Uh, we've, we're, we're looking at so many folks in, in some of our uh, ongoing conversations with the community, folks who are scared to go to the doctor because of the public charge in itself. This is something that, you know, currently at this point, we need to start to look at what are the, some of the larger impacts that's going to have in our community. Um, uh, for, for the last few weeks, we've had multiple discussions with our religious leaders to ensure that they are not uh, having the mosques open. And that is uh, with, with, the, with, with the governor's uh, mandatory requirement for you know, social uh, distancing and ensuring that only essential places can be open. Uh, we've had a lot of folks who oftentimes will go to the, uh, the mosques uh, or even public facilities uh, to get food and assistance in so many, uh, in, 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 to a certain extent, and particularly elderly as well, who right now we're trying to figure out where they are, how, who's, uh, how are they eating, uh, what type of support do they need. And those are vulnerable populations that oftentimes uh, there was not much of a, uh, a, net, uh, uh, a safety net for some of them as well. Uh, when we look at young folks as well, a lot of the families are being told right now to stay at home, uh, keep their kids at home. You've got a family of five or six, uh, probably a mother uh, raising them at home. And with the only food uh, that they're probably doing throughout the three meals that they have is breakfast and lunch at, uh, during the school season. And now there's five or six kids who have to the mother has to provide. And um, the last three days, we've had some conversation with the city of Seattle uh, that has a new voucher program for families that live in the city of Seattle. But unfortunately, that does not trickle down to the families who are actually south of, uh, south of King County uh, that live in Kent, uh, SeaTac, and Tequila. So we're, we're seeing a ripple effect, honestly, because of uh, the current conditions that uh, we were not prepared for. And when we're looking at social determinants of health, this has a negative impact in so many ways that I think we'll eventually have to see once the, the COVID-19 situation calms down. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Peter, what, what's your take on either health equity or we've kind of, if you want to touch on that or what's happening now with, with your experience with COVID-19? Peter, are you on? He's muted. Um, There, there we go. Okay. There you go. Um, sure. So um, it, it, it was kind of interesting to listen to the first uh, two folks before me in the sense that even though our population's needs are different, um, there's a lot of commonalities. And I think uh, what, what we see in our population is a sense in many of them of stigma and of being treated 
um, uh, inappropriately or disrespectfully by the mainstream medical community. And so uh, our clinic is sort of a safe place for a lot of people who would be reluctant to go, um, let's say, to an emergency room or um, a, a, another clinic. Um, and it, it depends, again, on the population, but, but what I uh, think of when I, when I uh, think about uh, appropriate care for LGBTQ folks is, uh, number one, that the care is, is respectful of who they are. And so, for example, for a transgender person, that would be uh, addressing them and referring to them uh, by their, uh, their gender, uh, their current gender, rather than uh, what, what might be um, listed on their uh, intake form um, or how they present uh, may be different from the gender that, that they uh, prefer. Uh, and for, uh, say, a sexually active gay man, it would be maybe a non-judgmental discussion of sexuality with that person. Um, so uh, both respectful and knowledgeable care are important. And I think that the, 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 the mainstream medical community is, is probably cool with the respectful part, but I think folks have been traumatized in the past by their experiences. Uh, in interacting with uh, the medical community, so that uh, they're reluctant to seek to seek care, and and uh, I think especially in the current environment where people are going to have to seek care outside of our clinic, uh, part of our role then is to assure them that they'll be treated respectfully. It's not always true. I mean, I will just say that I had a, a transgender patient um, evaluated in the emergency room over the weekend for what turned out to actually be COVID nineteen. Uh, and uh, they called me about this man who I had not heard of, which turned out to actually be uh, a transgender woman that I was taking care of. But um, because the person's identification was male, they were basically uh, sort of uh, transformed into a man in order to be uh, seen in the emergency room. And that makes things just a lot more stressful for a person uh, uh, to, to be misgendered and to be treated um, in, in such a way. So. That's, I think, our main goal. Our goal is to get to keep people from needing to access the emergency room, but if they need to, uh, it's important they be treated respectfully. Thank you, Peter. Um, Mariel, um, we had one comment saying, uh, what is the difference between health disparities and health equity? Can you, can you kind of touch on that? Mariel. Okay. Are you there? There you yeah, are. I'm right here. Sorry, sorry. Um, definitely. So I, I, I in looking at um, the comment from um, one of the viewers, you know, she was asking about describing the WHO or the World Health Organization's definition of health. And this definition actually came about in 1946. And, and how the WHO defined health is that it's not just the state of physical, mental, and social well-being, but in which disease and infirmity are absent. And so, um, you know, Ahmed, Nicole, and um, Peter both touched, all three of them touched on the question of um, the social determinants of health, as well as those barriers to be able to access care um, or to be treated with, you know, you know, sometimes with basic human dignity. And, um, you know, the idea of health equity is, is really one in which the system, the health system, and the other um, peripheral systems that um, feed into an individual's health are, are going to be creating the environment where an individual can successfully um, take care of themselves, take care of their families, well-being, and in health. So a really good example would be, um, you know, Ahmed mentioned about um, folks that are immigrants and that, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we have refugees that are coming into the United States, they're leaving, um, they're not just leaving uh, their country of origin because of economic disparity, um, but they're oftentimes leaving military situations. They're leaving wars or they're leaving juntas. And, um, you know, depending on how um, you know, how we uh, respond in a crisis, right? So thinking of our role as, as an HMAC, you know, how we set up, let's say, isolation and quarantine sites, you know, is it something that's going to be set up in a way that it's not going to re-traumatize individuals? 
you know, we're, we're wanting to provide care and supportive systems and an environment for those that do not have a safe way to um, quarantine themselves at home, but we want to make sure that that's an environment that is also going to be um, supportive of not just their health, but their cultural, religious um, beliefs, um, as well as, you know, not doing um, more undue harm onto the individual. So in terms of the COVID-19 outbreak now, how, how is, what's, what's happening now, the impact on public health clinics, et cetera, mm -hmm. and how can you still keep that equity, health equity yeah. um, principles? So um, our, our structure here um, in King County is very different. Um, it's what's called the incident command structure or system. Um, that's very much, um, a, the system is very similar to what you will find within, um, let's say, the, uh, a fire response um, or even a military structure um, where you, you have the different branches that are accounting for, like, let's say, for example, testing or logistics or planning on how you're working towards a response. The difference for our ICS structure here in King County is that we actually have an equity officer that's embedded within the HMAC leadership, and that's the role that I'm currently serving in. Um, and myself, along with my colleagues in the equity response team, um, you know, our charge is to be able to work with the folks as they're operationalizing um, our plans, as, as we're coming up with policies or guidance, um, as we're, you know, trying to, um, you know, implement this on the ground, that we're taking into account um, the, the needs of the community as well as, as you know, the idea of, you know, to do no harm. Um, with that being said, there are so many moving pieces, um, you know, with, with COVID-19, not just our jurisdiction, but many jurisdictions across the world um, are, you know, you're needing to mobilize and be very nimble as well as needing to respond very quickly. Um, and, I, and you're working with, with um, different entities, whether they're jurisdictions um, at the state, local, or, or federal level, you're working with um, businesses, you're working with organizations, and you know how how can you um, how can you work with them in in getting um, in getting the response out there? And so um, I think you know it's our role as an equity response team, but it's also um, the role of our HMAC in that we're working together to try to really mitigate harm and make sure that we're providing access to to healthcare as well as to the services. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, Nicole, what, what are the specific impacts now of COVID-19, the COVID-19 outbreak in, in your work with the homeless community? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so many, <laughs> so yeah. many impacts. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of people who are in congregate settings. So, so if, maybe if I just span um, out a little bit, um, we have um, on any given day, I think we have a, a, about 11 or 12,000 people in our county who are living homeless. And about um, half of those um, folks have um, access to some kind of shelter and about half do not have access to shelter. So we have a lot of people who don't have any access um, to shelter. They are, um, of course, always incredibly vulnerable. Um, they are particularly vulnerable now in a number of ways. So those who are living unsheltered um, don't have access really to, to information. Um, and, um, and we know that people um, depend on community amenities, even if they're not um, homeless service specific. Um, and pretty much every community amenity is closed now. Um, every library, community center, um, at any store you can go into for a few minutes. Um, and so what we're hearing from the unsheltered um, individuals who we work with is that they're, they're literally freezing. They, can, they cannot get inside even for a few moments a day. Um, they, um, a lot of people are often um, doubled up in tents or just sleeping outside exposed. And so a risk of exposure is huge. Um, meal programs are closed. Um, they um, are uh, struggling to get access to food. Um, the um, and with every um, uh, kind of indoor place you can get into um, being closed, people have no access to running water, to wash their hands, to go to the bathroom, um, and this is creating um, huge um, risks just to health generally and specifically around um, COVID nineteen. Since um, hand washing and ability to um, 
to sanitize and keep clean is so essential. Um, so all the things that we know work, physical distancing, um, constant cleaning and sanitizing, um, you know, access to just um, healthy habits are all totally inaccessible to our unsheltered population. Um, and the, uh, our community response has struggled. So even going a few hours with that, without having access to those things can be a struggle. We're starting to see some community and, and I'll say our, um, because of the nature of the crisis, we've closed down things so much more quickly than we have opened up things for this population. So um, every um, public bathroom in um, the region has shut down in our parks um, and in our community centers and, 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 light and similar. And we are just starting to see um, uh, mobile bathrooms, hand washing stations getting set up now. Most of them are not set up. I think City of Seattle this weekend is rolling out a bunch of um, mobile bathrooms and hand washing stations in locations where unsheltered people um, are, are um, known to uh, frequent or congregate. So that is helpful. And I think some um, other private organizations are also helping in that regard. For our sheltered population, um, we have 5,000 congregate shelter beds in the state of Washington. And I think a little over 2,000 of those um, congregate shelters are located within King County. Um, and so when we are operating um, under public health um, guidance that says the number one um, way to stay safe from the spread of the virus is to stay at home. We have certain populations of people who are at great risk for exposure um, because they don't have the opportunity to be at home um, or to be in a home setting um, that um, allows them to physically distance from other people. Um, so homeless individuals uh, certainly are within that group. I would also say um, people in jails and prisons um, are at extreme risk, um, as are um, people living in congregate long-term care settings um, and a few other kind of institutionalized um, settings. And so um, the, the interesting and um, concerning thing about those populations is not only are they at great risk for exposure across a great number of people in a short amount of time, they also are at the greatest risk for death or serious illness if they do become infected with COVID-19, uh, with coronavirus, because, because um, they are often in these high risk categories in terms of um, age, a medical condition, et cetera. So those are uh, some of the challenges um, that we're dealing with um, DESC operates about, as I said, 600 um, beds in congregate settings, um, the largest, I think, in Washington State. And at any given time, um, we are seeing about 10% um, of our clients in those settings exhibiting um, COVID-like symptoms. And so the ability to track sy symptoms and respond accordingly um, has been a tremendous challenge. Um, and we have really gotten to the point where um, given the uh, shortage of other public health interventions um, that we're all experiencing and our healthcare delivery system is experiencing so acutely, um, we are finding that the risks to people in congregate settings are, um, are too extreme. So we started off um, as we, when we saw the first uh, um, cases in King County um, in the, um, in the uh, nursing center in Kirkland um, play out, we, we started to immediately work towards physically distancing folks in our shelters. We operate 500 shelter beds every night and we work to um, ensure that all the sleeping arrangements were at least six feet apart for everybody. Um, that was a tremendous effort that included um, expanding to a new location plus putting up some of our highest risk, um, most frail clients into hotels um, around town. Um, but what we see now is that um, physical distancing in a congregate setting really only works if you have the ability to quickly identify people who are symptomatic, um, either remove them from the site or test them and get results very quickly. Um, and with lack of, um, we are seeing testing supplies ramp up right now. 
Um, but what we are not seeing is um, the ability to engage um, effectively with this population of folks who have all these barriers to healthcare. So um, mm. public health, for instance, set up um, a great testing site um, in downtown Seattle for healthcare workers and people in high risk groups, including people who are homeless. Um, so far, DESE has had less then five people get tested at that downtown clinic because they just are not um, going to go to a clinic and wait on a long line to get a test for a disease that they don't even understand. And so um, outreach um, or inreach into homeless service settings is essential for some of these highest risk um, patients and the um, capacity to stand that up quickly is a challenge. And I'd say DESC is actually um, has a, quite an advantage over many homeless service agencies because um, we are a behavioral health um, agency. Um, we actually, we have 35 medical staff um, within our team and we have redeployed that team um, to go back to their kind of basic medical training. They're all specialists in psychiatric care, um, but they are now really our frontline um, COVID assessment assessment and response team. Um, so we do have that great advantage, um, but um, we don't have um, the ability to um, redeploy um, these teams in the same way that traditional medical clinics do and of course public health does. So we've been partnering really closely with public health and with our other healthcare partners, including Harborview Medical Center, to try to make sure we stand up um, the right uh, things. But these are some of the um, immense challenges that we're, that we're facing right now. And these are not just risks to the people um, who would be exposed, but they are um, risks to all of us in terms of um, the impacts of seeing large numbers of vulnerable people um, being potentially exposed to the virus. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I just wanted to remind um, participants that you can type in your questions in the chat bar. We're gonna be jumping to that fairly soon, but I wanted to move on to Ahmed and see what, what their impacts are uh, of COVID, the COVID-19 outbreak in your community. Sure, Jeff. Uh, as you can imagine that COVID-19 is having uh, impact all across uh, uh, the country, almost everyone, but particularly more so within the immigrant refugee community. Uh, and uh, with, with regards to some of the things that have been mentioned, uh, for instance, the social distancing aspect of what we're expected to practice, uh, it is usually not a very uh, culturally uh, way for us to live as a, as a, as a community. And uh, folks usually gather together in large numbers. So it's becoming uh, one of those things that we have constantly have to remind folks uh, and, and ensuring that, you know, showing them ex exactly why, why, why they're doing that, why we need to do that. Um, for the, over the last few, uh, two, three, two weeks, as an organization, we had to put all our hands on deck and ensure that our staff and uh, the health professionals that are linked to Suman Health Board, as well as our community leaders, all work together to ensure that folks are getting appropriate, accurate, and timely information from the county and the uh, Department of Health. So we've come up with virtual trainings, uh, disseminating information through social media, WhatsApp groups, Facebook, and this has been shared over and over again al along the way, uh, and has been one of the most uh, in most useful tools we've used so far. But as a community, uh, majority of the uh, folks that we are within the Somali community are small business owners. Some of them are Uber drivers. Some of them have clean, cleaning, uh, cleaners that, uh, or daycare owners. And this has impacted negatively in, in so many ways. Uh, we see folks who have to uh, uh, you know, lay, lay off some of the employees or now that they have to shut down their big, small businesses. And that impact is having a, uh, it's having an, a huge negative impact uh, within our community as well. As I mentioned early on, food insecurity is one thing that also has been mentioned multiple times in some of the discussions we have with the community. Um, families large with, with large number of kids who are home or even so ones who have limited uh, income and all of a sudden they are not able to go to work. Some of us are very lucky to be able to work from home and be able to still earn a living for by, by doing so. But some of our community members don't have that luxury and a lot of them are worrying about how do they pay for their usual uh, the, the, you know, standards of living, including uh, 
the housing payments and so forth. Uh, well, we're getting a lot of communications out there indicating that, you know, folks cannot be foreclosed on or their rents can, you know, they can pay in th three months down the road. But still, the, the impact is so heavy and, and huge in the fact that some of them don't even have that savings to be able to come up with that, you know, three months of, of rent uh, once we, uh, we pass this, this situation. And then there is, uh, you know, we've got the elderly folks who are also not who are also impacted uh, in, 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 in negative, as I mentioned early on, as well as funeral homes. It's interesting that we've got a lot of phone calls about you know, families uh, who have uh, lost live, loved ones, not necessarily through because of coronavirus, but just uh, through uh, in the past few weeks. And you know, now they have to say uh, their, their, their goodbyes to their families are not able to, to visit them in person during the ceremonies. And that is something that we're currently sharing a lot of that information with, with our religious leaders as well, and ensuring that folks continue to practice social distancing. Um, but it's, it's, it's unusual uh, for our families who have lost their family members to not be able to go to uh, the funeral home and visit uh, during the last time of their lives. And these are, these are having huge impact on the community as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Peter, what, what would you say, what are the, the impacts of COVID-19 on the LGBT community and the people you serve? So um, being a primary care uh, clinic, I think a lot of the issues that we're dealing with now are probably common to many primary care clinics. So we have a lot of patients who uh, require medication to maintain their health, daily medication, and for example, uh, the, the most obvious example is folks living with HIV. We take care of about a thousand uh, HIV positive folks who require daily medication or they will become quite ill from their HIV. So um, there, there's a lot of anxiety in the community about ongoing access to meds. The CDC has recommended that we uh, obtain or we help patients obtain 90 days worth of meds uh, going forward uh, in case of uh, problems with uh, pipeline or, or um, uh, ability to, to get the meds. Uh, we run into roadblocks there where there's not coverage for 90 days worth. And so uh, some of what we're doing now is just sort of scrambling to try to make sure our patients can get that 90 days. Patients also, especially folks with HIV, wonder if, they, if their HIV is one of these conditions that will make them at higher risk of complications from the novel coronavirus. It doesn't seem to be the case, though, but the CDC has put out a whole uh, page about uh, considerations for folks with HIV in the era of um, coronavirus. And so a lot of what we're doing is communicating with concerned patients about what their particular increased risk might be. Um, another, and, and there's many issues because the, the populations we deal with are, are diverse, but another issue which I think is common to many folks now in Seattle is with the uh, sort of sheltering in place that we're doing. There's people that were already uh, isolated enough and now they're, they're sort of stuck in their, their dwelling and they, they don't really have a support system. We take care of a lot of uh, LGBT elders who uh, have a limited support network anyway and so there's no uh, now um, physical way for them to go out and um, socialize. So they're uh, they're more socially isolated and something that maybe the other folks alluded to as well is this sort of psychiatric morbidity of this uh, period of time where people are, are sheltering in place. We're, we are not uh, seeing many patients in person. We're trying to do everything through uh, telehealth and telephone with folks. And uh, we're doing a whole lot of hand holding now with our, our patients who are sitting at home and, and concerned uh, not only about their isolation, but about, about their health and their health risks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to jump to a, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, question on the chat room. Um, what are a, sp a few specific actions people can take to best support the communities you serve and help you in addressing the current challenges? Um, I, how about you just start, Peter? Gee, uh, I don't know. You know, the, the, the group, I think, and again, it, 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 it generalizes to the whole uh, community at large, is, is older folks. Because number one, they're at greater risk of, of complications. Number two, they may not have a big support network. And so 
things like uh, shopping for an elderly neighbor, which has been uh, mentioned uh, a lot in the in the media. Um, I think I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing that people can do for for other people. Um, I, I can't really think of in the, the the people that we serve. I can't really think of other things that the community at large can do. I'd, I'd love to I'd love to hear suggestions, but um, but no, that that's like the main thing. Ahmed, what, what do you think? Do you have a, some suggestions? Right, yeah, so I think uh, as far as the larger population, I'm not quite sure if there's anything particular that, that, that they can do in, but what are some of the things that we're asking folks is ensuring that, particularly with the elderly people, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, it's been mentioned earlier by Dr. Peter Shalik, uh, a lot of folks who have uh, limited access to medications, particularly uh, three months supply. I think one of those things that we see a lot of elderly people is like they, with, with the outbreak of COVID-19, some of them are caught, caught off guard and I think it will be useful for uh, in general, not particularly related to the Somali community because we're already organizing some of our own health professionals and folks who have uh, uh, at least allowed to go and be able to serve the community to some extent to ensure that they go and visit the uh, the, the elderly folks or at least call them to ensure that they are getting what they need whether it's grocery shopping or getting their medications and so forth but i think uh in this time uh, i think one thing that i would honestly suggest is just check on our neighbors uh check on folks who are vulnerable and just call on them just to make sure that they are doing okay because sometimes uh someone who is um isolated for so long could have uh, uh, mental breakdown and so forth. Uh, There's some of the refugee and immigrant folks who have gone through trauma, uh, PTSD, untreated PTSD. We're noticing some of them are actually just experiencing that because there is a correlation between uh, triggers that are associated with government requests uh, because of places where the folks come from. Sometimes when government says certain things, uh, it can be translated in, in uh, with the prior experiences that they had. Uh, and, and I think Muriel earlier talked talk briefly about, you know, the isolation centers that we're, we're, we're looking at because there are folks who have come from places where they were isolated by governments and never came back and they have those traumas that they live with uh, uh, from past experiences. But in general, I think uh, just checking on folks, I think uh, is one of the most important thing I can think of at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Nicole, what, what do you think? How yeah, I would um, endorse all of those ideas. Um, you know, we, we need really, and I know there's been a lot of messages in the media about this. We really, really need people to follow the public health um, directives from, from the governor all the way down and the guidance to stay physically distanced. I know it's it's really, really difficult, emotionally difficult for all of us to do it. And I know the governor said yesterday, we're probably gonna have to do it long, for longer than he originally anticipated, but it is essential. And at the same time, it's really this, um, this issue that Ahmed and Peter are both talking about around social connectedness is also essential. We need to make sure um, we are staying connected and it's um, an important time um, for for those of us who are able to reach out to our neighbors and our family um, close and far away to make sure um, that they are um, doing okay and to and for those of us um, who can do those sorts of small tasks um, it's important I went grocery shopping for my friend's mom yesterday and left the groceries outside of her house for her those are small little things um, that we can do that can make um, a huge difference in people's lives. In terms of the work that we're doing at DESC, um, I'd say we've been hit <laughs> super duper hard um, with um, immense escalating expenses um, to respond. As I said, we've spread across multiple new sites. We're renting hotel rooms to try to physically distance people. Um, our, we've spent um, over $60,000 in the last three weeks just on additional disinfectant and cleaning supplies to go through and make sure all of those high touch surfaces are disinfectant on a regular um, basis. Um, we are soliciting um, any and all kinds of um, um, uh, personal protective um, equipment that folks um, can provide that may not be medical grade or evidence-based. 
um, because we have to make sure with such a shortage that our that our hospital and um, frontline um, clinic workers are having that. But um, but folks um, serving um, homeless individuals also need uh, protection, as I said. Um, about 10% of the people that we serve are exhibiting COVID consistent symptoms and we don't know until we get tests back um, whether or not they actually um, um, test positive for coronavirus, which means we have a really extreme need for PPE. So we um, last weekend um, launched a, ma a homemade mask making um, project and we have um, dozens of volunteers around the region who have been sewing fabric, cotton fabric masks for our staff. Um, so far we have received, I think 700 masks, um, which uh, we are deploying out to our staff. They have to be washed daily. Um, they're not evidence-based, um, but they are better than having nothing at all. So that is a, a thing that um, is, can be helpful. Um, and the way I see a note here about how people can learn about this stuff, um, we are trying to keep up to date a COVID specific link on our website that both updates um, the community about what we've been doing and the donations that we need. And our website is um, desc.org. So if you go there, you can um, find the link uh, to, to some of those. Um, we're scrambling to keep it updated, but uh, mm -hmm. that, that is what we're doing. So, um, and I also, I do want to comment that um, we work very closely with two um, or three actually um, food providers who have stepped up tremendously. So um, Fair Start, which is a well-known organization that does uh, training, also provides uh, the, a large uh, number of meals to homeless service sites uh, around the region. Um, they, along with Operation Sack Lunch or OSL um, and Northwest Harvest, have helped us to increase our daily meal service um, by 3,000 individual meals each day. So um, while we have traditionally done community style meals in both our supportive housing and shelter settings, we've moved to individually packaged meals that we are um, delivering to folks. We're no longer having people eat in a community setting, but rather um, if they have an apartment in their apartment or bedside um, in a shelter setting. Um, and that has been a tremendous um, amount of work and requires a tremendous amount of resource. So support of those um, food service organizations is tremendous because they have been stepping up. Um, Fair Start, I think, made a commitment to increase their meal delivery by 25,000 meals across the region. Um, and that is essential for vulnerable folks to be able to um, not go out in the community to meal programs or food banks, et cetera. Nicole, a quick uh, follow-up. Um, you said you need more testing of, of people experiencing homelessness. What happens if someone tests, is tested positive for COVID-19? What, what okay, well, knock on wood, thankfully that hasn't happened. And the interesting thing is, as of a couple of days ago, actually, um, multiple large cities across the U.S. had not seen um, positive coronavirus tests um, in their homeless response system. Um, that's not true everywhere. Tacoma, we're seeing a growing number of um, cases, um, positive cases. New York City, um, it's, it's growing qu pretty quickly there um, in terms of all vulnerable populations, including in the homeless response system. Um, we um, have a whole team that, that are tracking symptoms, um, prioritizing people for tests, um, tracking test results, um, and um, what we will do is ensure that people get the care that they need. So if they need to go to the hospital, they'll do that. The county um, has worked to set up um, hundreds of quarantine and isolation um, beds um, that are specifically for um, either people who have tests pending um, and there's limited beds um, for people in that circumstance, but certainly for people who test positive to make sure they're, they get out of um, a congregate setting. Um, uh, for those who are, are able to isolate, for those who we serve in apartments and supportive housing, for those who are able to isolate um, during the course of their illness and be monitored to see if they need a higher, higher level of care, um, what we are really focusing on to the greatest extent is keeping people out of um, the hospitals unless they really need acute level care. 
Um, and if they can isolate at home, we want them to do that. Now, not everyone in this um, tenant population group can do that um, because um, their behaviors make it um, just challenging for them to just stay at home. So the symptoms of mental illness sometimes make it very difficult um, for people to be in, in full isolation. So we are monitoring um, for that. Um, there's a County's been a great partner in public health. It's been amazing. I really do think um, King County Public Health um, is setting a course um, for the nation. Um, I, I do think we're doing it better here in King County than in many um, places around the country. There's a, a question here. Maybe this is for you, Nicole. Also, what what on the sidebar? What can we do on a policy level? Um, have, do you see the chat? You see the question? I'm seeing. I'm looking a little bit at it here. Yes, and, and from my from Gary, just, yeah. I'll just, I'll just state it in case people are calling in. I'm wondering about state financial supports for nonprofits who are responding to COVID-19 without budgeted resources to do so as we try to flatten the curve. So we only, only have a few minutes, so very short, if you could just keep yeah, it Yeah, so very quickly I'll say that um, under the emergency powers granted to the governor, um, he has um, broad latitude around spending. Um, the legislature did um, transfer $200 million into a, into a coronavirus um, response fund, um, but uh, the governor's powers under emergency declaration extend beyond that. Um, whether or not the legislature will be called back um, to look at um, budgetary um, addition investments or um, policy changes to protect Washingtonians is totally unclear to us at this time. Um, but le the legislative branch and the executive branch are connecting um, broadly every week and the leadership um, in the House and Senate are talking um, daily with the, with the governor's um, staff. So it's all very unclear. We were um, waiting to see what this federal stimulus package um, would have in it um, that helps us uh, understand what we need to do at the state level. Great, thank you. Uh, Mariel, uh, in the last Couple minutes, uh, we only have a few minutes. If you could chime in on what, what your suggestions are for what people can do to support efforts. Um, I think, you know, I can echo what um, Peter, Nicole and Ahmed said. Um, if you might've noticed that I'm using the term physical distancing as opposed to social distancing. And that's very deliberate on my part because we want folks to have that physical distance between them um, so that we reduce the the chance for them to become infected, but we don't we want to be able to reinforce the message of that physical distancing does not mean social distancing in the sense of that social connection between groups that it's so important, especially in moments of crisis um, um, that we need to be able to maintain. Um, I think from a county level perspective, um, I know that there've been there's been a really great response of individuals and groups and businesses that are wanting to either donate their time or donate resources such as hand sanitizer or, or PPEs. Um, if folks would like to uh, volunteer either their time, and these are non-medical volunteers, they can connect with donations at kingcounty.gov. Um, and then they'll be able to be able to plug, be plugged in as to um, as to where they could best support. Um, but I think also one of the things I'd like to, re, you know, touch on is the fact that there's a lot of hate and bias that's coming out right now, unfortunately, it has been since um, the first diagnosed case of um, COVID-19 in our country. And just the reminder that viruses don't discriminate. So if you see or hear of instances, um, whether it's on social media or um, in conversation of uh, with regards to who's at fault or um, stigmatizing language towards any individual or group, um, then, you know, it's, it's really important for us to be able to speak up as well and just to remind folks that viruses don't discriminate because they, they really don't. Um, and I just want to say because we couldn't do what we're trying to accomplish here in our region without the partnerships of community organizations, faith-based organizations, businesses, uh, behavioral health um, sectors, um, so many different groups that um, this crisis has really exposed the gaps in many of our services and in our system to be able to protect the most vulnerable. But people have been rising to the challenge. And you know, if I could strive a hopeful note, is that what we've been able to accomplish and what we are accomplishing and will hopefully have a lasting impact 
um, not just for our region, but I think nationally um, with a sense of, of really how we've come together and how we've really tried to um, provide additional supports to our most vulnerable in our community that my hope would be that it will continue beyond when we're in a crisis stage. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marielle. It's a good summary. Um, and thank you all, Nicole, Ahmed, and Peter, and Nuha back in the background. We have to close it up now. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time in this crazy period here in Seattle to, to, to talk to us about what you're experiencing and what people can do. For those participants who are online, um, feel free to keep asking the questions. I will put the questions to the speakers and get those responses back to you. And I've gotten um, confirmations from most of the speakers that they will share emails with me. So I can share those with you if you have any specific questions, but feel free to e email Seattle City Club um, and with any of your questions, we'll follow up with you. Um, look for the next um, Seattle City Club uh, event is on April 1st. Uh, we'll talking again about COVID-19 and outbreak um, with Tom Douglas and Dow Constantine. So that's our um, Civic Cocktail, our online version of Civic Cocktail. So thank you again, um, speakers, and thank you all for participating. Um, really appreciate it. And have a good day. Stay safe. And wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.